Okay, we have to uh, riot. We have to uh, get going here because the term is suddenly approaching its end. We've got a lot of stuff to cover. <laughs> and um, so the next the next step is to talk about talk about prices of consumer goods and prices in general. Uh, we talked about the theory of the firm, competition, and alleged monopoly, etc. The last the last phase here is to talk about the prices of factors of production and the different factor markets. Uh, Prices of factors of production, of course, are different kinds of labor, different kinds of land, and different kinds of capital goods. <clears throat> so everything has a price. The uh, wage, wage rates are the price of labor, uh, price of machines, price of raw materials, uh, et cetera, et cetera, price of land, rents of land. All these things are prices per unit of, uh, of uh, factors of production. And of course, the prices of factors of production are determined by demand and supply, just like <clears throat> Consumer goods. In other words, you have the price on the y-axis, quantity on the x-axis. In this case, quantity purchased or hired. <clears throat> so we now have alpha. Alpha meaning any of the, remember, alpha, beta, and gamma, dot, 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 are the factors of production. So we have prices of factors, many factor, quantity here. <clears throat> and uh, we have a falling demand curve and a supply, curve, supply line, which is vertical, in the short run, uh, <clears throat> except that for labor, as we'll see, it's not really it doesn't go down to the x-axis because nobody's going to work for zero or you know one half a penny per hour. So there's a it goes something like that. <clears throat> so at any rate, um, so we have a supply curve and we have a demand curve and the, and the supply and the intersection of the supply and demand again determine the price at any given time because, like with consumer goods, the price is higher than the equilibrium point, then you have a surplus, unsold surplus of labor or land or capital. Uh, unsold surplus of labor is unemployment, as we've seen with minimum wage law already. And if the price is below the <coughs> free market level, there'll be a shortage of labor, land, or capital goods, and the price will be driven up to the equilibrium point where supply and demand are equal. So it works as just like consumer goods. <coughs> the difference is Try to find out what determines what determines the falling demand curve, the shape of it. What determines the falling demand curve, <clears throat> the shape of the demand curve, consumer goods, as we know, is the law of diminishing margin utility. What determines it for factors of production? That's the next step. <clears throat> In other words, we know it's falling. We know that if, uh, if a worker asks for 20 cents an hour, it's going to be more if workers be higher than if he asks for $50 an hour. So but the question is, what exactly determines the shape of the demand curve, because it's not the utility to the, to the consumer here. In this case, it's the how much the, actually, the, the bottom line is, is how much the employer thinks he will get out of it. In other words, how much money he will, he will receive from this. That's the bottom line, and we, we have to show in detail how this works. Okay, okay so our, our next task is to figure out the demand curve for factors of production. <clears throat> and what specifically, we know it's falling, we now have to integrate into the rest of the system here. And how it's related to prices and production and productivity and all the rest of it, and demand, and demand, and demand for consumer goods. Okay, remember the production function. And we go back to the production function. Alpha of, of x combined with beta of y combined with gamma of z yields a certain quantity of the product, r. Uh, we used this before to, to, to show that. Uh, the production function is linear and homogeneous, and that if you, if you multiply each one by n, you get n times the product. And that, uh, uh, so you should have, you think you have an average, co constant average cost curve. It's not really constant because you can't, because of indivisibilities, you can't multiply everything by n. You can't multiply railroad tracks the same way you can multiply pins and, 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 uh, you know, gear sh and gears and whatever, and, and paper clips. As a result, you had a falling average cost curve, or u shaped average cost curve. So that's, why, that's how we use the production function before. We're not going to use it in a different way. <clears throat> what we're going to do now is to freeze beta, gamma, etc., and see what happens when alpha is varied. What happens to quantity? What happens to product? When you vary one factor of production, keeping the others constant. <clears throat> in other words, so this is a different use of the production function. We're now taking, this is, this is a variable factor. These are given, frozen, so to speak, at whatever quantity you're going to freeze it at, and see what happens to the product when you do that. <clears throat> uh, classically, with, with English economics, since 
economics more or less begins in Great Britain in the 18th century, late 18th century, when Britain was agricultural. <clears throat> the usual example is you take a fixed amount of land, a fixed amount of capital goods, say wheat farm, and you vary the number of laborers and see what happens to production. <clears throat> Uh, you don't have to go out and test it because it's really it's a question of logic. We'll see. It's pure logic. Uh, it's a logic of cause and effect. <clears throat> okay, the, um, so now we start. We have alpha, the variable factor on the, on the x-axis. Quantity, a variable factor. We have quantity produced now on the y-axis. Physical production, units, whatever it is. Gear shifts, cars, uh, loaves of bread, wheat, whatever it happens to be. <clears throat> Okay, and we freeze then beta, gamma, etc. are constant. Okay, these, are, these are given. We're, we're varying alpha. Well, if there's zero, again, we start at the point of origin. If there's no workers, if you have a wheat field with lots of, lots of acres of fertilizer and you know, capital equipment, you know, machines, agricultural machines, and no workers, nothing's going to happen. It'll be zero product. Zero alpha, zero product. You start at the point of origin. And you can't produce... Negative low, uh, bushels of wheat. Obviously, you have, you have to go up from here. So it goes up. As you increase the number of workers, uh, we're using workers is the classical way to do it. It's easy, you know, easy way to do it. You, keep, you have one worker on 100 acres with all the equipment, and you, you, have more than, you produce more than zero, and you keep going. And what you're measuring here is the in particular, is the quantity <coughs> per unit, per, per worker. In other words, you start, uh, this is physical units. So you're interested now in, in uh, particular in how many bushels of wheat per worker are you producing. At zero, you produce zero, of course. At one, you produce a certain amount. You keep going up. And this is, this is also called average physical product. In other words, product per, per acre or product per worker or whatever it happens to be. The physical product per the variable factor. So, you go up, and what the, the, the basic law of economics in this case, technology or economics, really law of cause and effect, is that at some point, <coughs> uh, Q over alpha will reach a maximum. Okay, this, is the, this is known as the law of returns, or law of physical productivity. <coughs> and law, of, law of diminishing returns is sometimes called. Uh, in other words, that as you increase alpha, starting with zero, at some point, uh, APP falls, reach, you know, starts falling, reaches a peak, starts falling. In other words, you can't increase, you can't increase APP forever. That's a, you're not saying when this is going to happen, but at some point, this is going to turn down. <clears throat> uh, now, how do you prove that? How do you prove this this law here that at some point, as as uh, as alpha increases, okay, uh, alpha average product starts falling. Well, if it didn't start falling, you do it by proving the opposite, showing the opposite is absurd. If it didn't start, if it didn't start falling at some point, it means you can increase average product forever. In other words, you could take, let's say you have 100 acres. If you want to have more wheat, you're stuck with 100 acres, and you're stuck with the same amount of capital and fertilizer and whatever, you know, raw material, etc. You can keep increasing the number of wheat as much as you want by just by pouring more workers in. Two million workers on 100 acres of land. You can still just keep increasing. Obviously, it's ridiculous. You can't do it. You reach a point, everybody's falling all over themselves. They can't even walk. Okay, So it starts turning down. This is APP, or Q over alpha. Now, if it didn't happen, if, it, if, it, if, 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 if look at the implications if it didn't start turning down, it would mean that, all, that there's no such thing that all factors are perfectly substitutable for other factors. In other words, if you don't have much land, you don't have much capital, you can could, you could turn out the same amount of product forever by simply pouring in more workers. Or the other way, if you, could, if you have only one worker, you can keep adding more land and somehow get, them more, get more uh, wheat, wheat forever. So this would imply that all factors are perfectly sub perfect substitutes for each other. Now, obviously, they're not perfect substitutes, otherwise you'd have only one factor in the whole world. You don't have one, more, only one factor. You've got lots of factors, lots of things which are partially substitutes. You can have less workers and more capital and still have the same equipment. You can't have no workers and all capital. In other words, you get to the point where th some things are, many things are fairly close substitutes, but they're not perfect substitutes. If they were perfect substitutes, they would be the same thing. 
So the fact that there's more than one factor in the world of production means that there are no perfect substitutes. So that, and therefore, you get to the point where the productivity goes down as you freeze the amount of, as you keep changing the proportion, as you freeze beta, gamma, etc., and keep pouring in more alpha, average productivity is going to turn down. So this is a law of, of uh, reality. It's a law of cause and effect. It's a basic philosophic law applied to all production. Now, some economists don't realize this. And they keep trying to test this. They go out and they actually they add more workers. They have a little experiment. Of course, the experiment always works because it has to. It's a law of logic. It's really a law of reality. It, has, it doesn't need to be confirmed all the time. It's the way life is. Okay, so average productivity uh, keeps falling. Uh, at one point, starts falling. It can never get negative, okay? You can never have minus one or minus five bushels, but it can get pretty low as you keep, as you keep going. Uh, now, let's look at our, remember our old average marginal relationship here. For every average, there's a marginal. For every average of height, there's a marginal guy coming in, a marginal basketball player, a marginal midget. It changes the, the average, okay? In other words, when average, so at the, at the point when average is going up, marginal is higher than average. Marginal physical product, which is defined as delta Q divided by delta alpha. In other words, if you add one more worker, how many more bushes of wheat will it bring in? Okay. So ma marginal average productivity is Q divided by alpha. Number, bushes of wheat divided by number of workers, in this case. Marginal physical product is... The increased amount of wheat, or they've decreased in some cases, uh, uh, for adding one more worker. So, marginal, when average is increasing, you remember, when average goes up, increases, marginal is always higher than average. So, we have, it goes something like this. When average is falling, marginal is below the average. When the average is at the peak, the marginal is equal to the average. So, it cuts in like something like this. So this will be the marginal physical product, delta Q divided by delta alpha. A marginal product can get negative if you keep going, as you have you know two million people <laughs> trying to produce uh, wheat in a hundred acres. If you add one more worker, you'll have less product. In other words, you'll have a, you wind up with even less product than you had before. So MPP can get below zero, can get can cut the the, the x-axis. Uh, APP can't. In other words, you can, can't have negative bushels for the whole product, but you can, you can produce less bushels than you did before. So <clears throat> eventually it goes below it. So this is our, <clears throat> these are the productivity curves, basic productivity. They don't have to be smooth or whatever. We're not assuming that. We're simply assuming it goes up, reaches a peak, and has to reach a peak, reach a peak because it eventually starts falling. And marginal then goes up faster and earlier, cuts down, and and, and, and is the same as the, average at the peak of the average. <clears throat> okay, now it's, if you're looking at, we look at where the, an employer will tend to use factors of production, uh, a, a wheat farmer or a produ computer producer or whatever, okay. where are they going to tend to use these people or these factors? They're obviously not going to use, nobody, uh, quiet place, nobody worth his Nobody with any smarts at all is going to employ people, hire another worker in order, in order to produce less wheat. Obviously idiotic. You're paying somebody and winding up with few, less bushes of wheat than you had before. So nobody is going to produce in this zone here. We mark out the zones. So let me make this a little, a little larger. Here's physical units, Q, here's alpha, here, starts at the point of origin, goes down like that. That's really about the same, anyway. Something like this. Nobody's going to produce in this zone here, zone three. In other words, nobody's going to produce in a zone where, what am I saying here? I'm just going to go like that. Nobody's going to produce in a zone where MPP is negative. <clears throat> so this is a forbidden area. In other words, this is an area where nobody's going to employ any factors of production. You hire one, you pay, you pay money and get less production. 
Um, same way, nobody's going to produce on the line here. If they know what the line is, nobody's going to hire another worker and get zero increase in product. That's obviously ridiculous, too. You're paying out good money and getting no benefit for it. So this means that this, the line here, plus the zone three, is a verboten zone. Nobody's going to employ factors of production, land, labor, or capital in that area. Now, what I'm going to try to demonstrate, this is much more tricky. This is pretty obvious. The three is a, for, is a forbidden zone. <clears throat> I'm going to try to demonstrate, which is much trickier, is in the same way, this zone here is also forbidden. In other words, what you have, what the problem in zone three is you've got too many workers in relation to the amount of capital and land you've got. You've got an excess amount of workers per uh, other factors. And similarly here, you got, still have an excess. You have, in other words, you have, the marginal physical productivity of workers is negative here and zero here. So you're not going to produce in that area. In the same way, in this zone here, you have so few workers, there's too few workers and too much, you have an excess amount of land and capital compared to the number of workers. So in this zone, zone one, you have a negative marginal physical productivity for, for the fixed factors, for land, capital, etc. And here you have zero physical productivity for fixed factors. So in the same way, nobody's going to produce in this area either. Now this is going to be tougher to demonstrate. <clears throat> But it's, it's, the, it's the other side of the coin. <clears throat> in other words, here you have like one worker in 10,000 acres and lots of equipment. He has to, and you, and you're in, if you're operating in this area, here, two workers or whatever, one worker, everybody's going to be rushing around trying to, trying to use everything. You're going to wind up with less production if you had half the number of land or half the number of machines. In other everybody's going to be racing around trying desperately to use it. You, you decrease your productivity by doing that. If you had half the number of machines and half the number, amount of land, you have a higher physical product. <clears throat> So um, to try to demonstrate this, <coughs> I'm going to take an ex example I just made up this morning. It's easy to do it. Just take your own example. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to have a table in the area of this area here, which is rising average physical product. Where, where well, yeah, where average physical product is rising, <coughs> or is it a peak? Okay. So. Let's take an, uh, just a typical table here. Here's alpha. Here's the quantity, the product. Zero, zero, you start with the point of origin. So we want to have a zone, describe a zone, figures for a zone of rising average physical product. So this, this is Q over alpha, which is APP. And uh, so let's make this one, let's say this is two, six, 3, 12, 4, 16, 5, 18. In other words, I'm describing here is an average physical product which starts going up. This is a 2 here. 6 divided by 2 is 3, 4. Reaches a peak here and then starts falling. It's now here 3.6. This is our Q over alpha curve. So this, what I'm saying is this zone here is a forbidden zone. Nobody, no factor is going to be employed in this zone. Uh, the MPP is, uh, which is delta Q over delta alpha is 2 minus 0 is 2, 4, 6 minus 2 is 4, 12 minus 6 is 6, 6 minus 12 is 4, 18 minus 6 is 2. So here we see the marginal physical product reaches an earlier peak, which is a peak here instead of here, which is more or less the peak there, at least the secondary peak. And it starts falling and intersect, intersects here and then goes below it. Uh, okay, let's demonstrate the craziness of this zone here, this whole, this whole system and why nobody's going to be employed, nothing's gonna, no factors will be employed in this zone. What we're saying here is this, we're taking, take this. We're saying if you take four of alpha, four units of four workers, and combine it okay, with fixed factors, whatever they are, beta, gamma, etc. Okay. Then you wind up with 16 uh, units of the product, 16 bushels of wheat or whatever it is. So, and we're also saying that two units of alpha combined with beta, gamma, etc. will yield uh, Six units. Okay. But if you take these, if you take, remember our law of linear homogeneous factors, uh, uh, home production function. 
you take two units of alpha here and combine it with all this divided by two, beta, gamma, etc., divided by two, you should get eight. In other words, you cut everything in two. And you'll get you'll then get two units of alpha divided by the fixed factors over two gives you eight units, whereas two units of alpha divided by beta, I mean combined with beta, gamma, etc., gives you six units. In other words, you increase your production by cutting the number of amount of fixed units in half. It's obviously crazy. You're not going to do that. You're going to be in this area where you have you're hiring or, or buying fixed units and using them, which, inc which decreases your production by t by two units. Because you're, in other words, what you're doing is you have an excess amount of fixed units. If you cut the fixed units in half, you'll have more production than you had before. So this is the way of describing this situation. Okay, so it's, it's going on the on, on the a linear homogeneous production function. You just you're, you're overloaded with fixed units, and you cut them in, in half. You get more with two alpha than you do with, uh, with with twice as much. So therefore, nobody will operate in this zone. You just eliminate, get out of the zone fast. We we have a negative marginal productivity of fixed units, fixed factors. So this means that all 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 factors will be employed in this zone here, zone two. <clears throat> It's also why it's called the law of diminishing returns. It, it can be an, every factor be employed in an area where its average productivity, what's the, what's the definition of the area? It's the area of the zone where APP is falling, it's, it's, it's declining, okay. and where MPP, of course, is greater than zero. This, is, this, this means in, in this area here, where the, Average physical production is declining, and marginal phys physical production is also declining, but, but greater than zero. You're not going to go into this area where it's zero or negative. So these are the two definitions of the conditions of zone two. The average, you're, you're producing enough of a variable factor, using enough of the variable factor, so the APP is declining, but not too much so the marginal, marginal MPP is, gets zero or, or below it. <clears throat> so it means all factors of production, all labor, all land, all capital goods, whatever, will be employed in zone two. <clears throat> Given, of course, the technological knowledge and all the other conditions, this is all, you know, using the, at a maximum. You're trying to use your maximum productivity, which is the same thing as using your minimum cost. You're trying to keep the, the, the average cost envelope, or the, excuse me, the total cost envelope as low as possible. So, uh, okay, so, you, so then the, uh, We've already we've now established that every factor will be employed in zone two. <clears throat> now we're trying to get to the so every factor will be employed in the area of a, a diminishing uh, marginal physical productivity and diminishing average physical productivity. Now we're trying to get from um, from this from large average physical product. Uh, a marginal physical product, a revenue product. In other words, remember the whole purpose of producing something is not to produce the actual wheat, but also for the employer or the businessman to make money out of it, to get income. So what he's interested in is taking the wheat and selling it. So therefore, the demand curve now comes in, demand curve for wheat now comes into the picture. Uh, we integrate this whole thing. We have, so what do we have now? We have the falling demand curve. We know there's a falling demand curve for the actual product, for wheat or whatever happens to be the fellow selling. And, uh, and marginal revenue, of course, is also falling below it. And uh, we're now interested in the marginal and average revenue product. They take marginal revenue product. The marginal revenue product is defined as how much money will be brought in, how much revenue will be brought into the firm for one more hiring one more worker or one more acre of land, renting out one more acre of land or whatever. So, this is delta TR divided by delta alpha. I'm trying to get at this. What you do is you take your delta TR over delta alpha depends on how much money, in other words, how much money, how much revenue one more worker will add to the firm, bring into the firm, whether it's a wheat firm or a computer firm or whatever. It depends on how much you'll produce and how much the thing will be sold for. So we have, uh, okay, this is, um, this is a marginal physical product. Okay, is <clears throat> delta Q divided by delta alpha. Marginal 
revenue is how much the next unit of wheat or computers or whatever will bring in total revenue. That's delta to the firm. Delta TR divided by delta Q. Right? In other words, we have marginal physical... We already talked about marginal revenue. That's the underneath of the man curve. The man curve is average revenue. That's the TR divided by Q. And marginal revenue is how much more revenue is brought in by one more unit of one more bushel of wheat or one more loaf of wonder bread, one more computer or whatever that's being sold. So we take then the marginal physical product, our new our new concept, multiply by marginal revenue, and we get the marginal revenue product as a factor. In other words, this these things this cancels out and we and we wind up with delta T R divided by delta alpha. So the marginal revenue product of each worker, the same way with average revenue product, we're not that interested in average revenue product, it's the same thing. Average revenue product is <coughs> ARP is TR divided by alpha. That will equal APP, which is <coughs> Q over alpha, times average revenue, which of course is a man curve, uh, <coughs> which is TR divided by Q. This cancels that. We have TR over Q, or average revenue product. So we do is, in other words, we multiply the physical product by the revenue, and we get the revenue product. <coughs> so in the case of marginal revenue product, multiply marginal physical product times marginal revenue, and we get marginal revenue product. Now since um, so now we now, now we have the thing with the employer is interested. He's interested in finding that. If he buys one more machine or hires one more, rents one more piece of land or hires one more worker, how much money will he get out of it? How much income will it bring in? How much revenue will it bring in? And now we at least conceptually know what it is. We multiply the physical product by the, by the revenue, by the marginal revenue. <clears throat> and, uh, and we know the marginal revenue is falling, okay, at all times, because the average revenue is falling. We know the demand curve is falling. We know the marginal revenue is falling. We also know at this point, the marginal physical product is falling because everything is employed in that zone. Okay, so if this is falling, that's falling. Then the the total must fall. In other words, you have two falling curves. You multiply them, you wind up with another falling curve. Okay, so we now have uh, another set of curve here. <clears throat> we have uh, in zone two, which is now we're interested in, it's the relevant. The relevant zone in which all factors will be employed, we have falling average revenue product and falling marginal revenue product. <clears throat> for every factor and for every uh, every product, it's alpha and this will be dollars now. <clears throat> so we've established now why a marginal revenue per product, why the MRP curve is falling and and what it what it what it's composed of, namely the physical product, MRP, MPP, times the marginal revenue, which is the physical product is determined by the technology and, and you know the, the smarts of the manager and that sort of stuff. And the and the and the, the demand curve and marginal revenue curve is determined by the consumer, how much the consumer values the product, how much he's willing to spend on it. Okay, this integrates the consumer and physical production, the whole physical laws of physical production. The next, the final thing, the final thing to demonstrate here is the MRP curve will be the demand curve for the factor. That's the final step here. In other words, I've established so far the, the physical product. What happens to the average APP and MPP curves? Why the APP has to go down, turn downward eventually, and then why every factor is going to be employed in zone two and not in one and three, and and then what determines MRP, which would be the falling. MPP curve times the falling marginal revenue curve. The next, the final step is to show that this will be the demand curve for the factor. Uh, for this reason, okay. here's an employer. Let's say this is uh, <coughs> we have. Uh, let's say it's wage rate, but it could also apply to capital goods prices, machine prices of machines, or rent of land. And here's the wage rate. Why is this on? Is this on? This one? Wait a minute. Some noise coming from it.
the ghost machine. Okay. <laughs> huh? right. Here's uh Here's our MRP curve, marginal revenue product curve for every factor, which we've seen now has to be falling in the relevant zone. If this is a wage rate, okay, let's say this is a given wage rate, this is established on the market, whatever it is, say $5 an hour. And the question then is, how much will the employer hire at that wage rate, say $5? I'm going to demonstrate now he's going to hire this amount. In other words, this, 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 is, this is 200 people. That's, that's 200. He'll be hiring 200 workers at $5 an hour. For this reason, if he hires, say, 100 workers, the wage rate is still $5. That's, I'm assuming wage rate is $5 now. That's the market wage rate. Uh, at that point, the marginal revenue product for every worker, in other words, the worker will bring in to every firm, say, $7 in MRP. And cost only $5 it means he's getting a $2 profit per worker. Well, he'll keep hiring more workers then. In other words, remember the, the, the goal of every employer is to maximize the profits. The goal of every businessman. So if he's getting $2 per worker, he's going to keep hiring more people. If he hires more, he still gets more profit, but now it's going down a little bit. Instead of $2, it's down buck ninety-five. And he keeps going, keeps hiring people until the surplus is eliminated. In other words, until you get to the point where the, uh, he's hiring, getting no more. He's getting, actually, this assumes he's getting five dollars now from each worker, and he's hiring for five dollars. That's a little peculiar because he should be getting a, a wee bit more. But for purposes of simplicity, let's assume he comes up right up to the point here, the of intersection, of a tangency, uh, intersection. So that, in other words, this doesn't mean he's making no profits. It means he's getting the maximum profit. He's, he's hiring workers until uh, the, the the MRP has fallen to the to the wage rate. Then he stops. Actually, it'll be a little bit to the left of that. Forgetting about that for purposes of simplicity. So if he if he doesn't hire 200, he's going to lose profits because he's he's, he's making two dollars per worker until he keeps going and going. Finally, he's making almost nothing per worker extra or profit, and he stops. Conversely, if he's hiring 300, let's say he's paying out five dollars an hour, he's only making four dollars an hour in revenue. He's losing a buck an hour. Obviously, he's not going to do that. He's going to fire workers or not hire them. Go quickly to the left here until he stops losing money. <laughs> And so it's pretty obvious. So then he gets back now again to the 200. In other words, market forces will impel any 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 employer to to hire exactly uh, almost exactly 200 workers at a five dollar wage rate. In other words, where the uh, at the MRP point, if the wage rate goes up, he's going to hire only 100. But he's, he's now you know if he still hires 200, he's going to be paying out uh, seven dollars an hour and making only five. So he's going to be losing two bucks an hour. How quickly fire these people until he gets to this point again? So in other words, if you say that, given the wage rate, you're going to hire as many workers as, as, as exactly equals the MRP, almost exactly equals it, uh, like that. That means you're defining the MRP curve as the demand curve for labor. That's what it is. In other words, remember what the demand curve is. The demand curve is the locus, is the expression of how much people will buy at any given price. If the prices of a chess set of seven bucks, you buy this many chess sets. Consumers, if the price is six bucks, you buy this many. If it's five bucks, you buy that many, et cetera, et cetera. That's what a demand curve means. That's the definition of a demand curve. It's how much will be it's like a freeze frame situation, where you find you determine how much people will buy at any given price. Similarly, if the, if the MRP curve will give you how much people are hired at any given wage, this means this is the demand curve for labor or any other factor. If this is the price of a machine, this is the demand curve for machines. This is the Rent of land is the demand curve for land. So in other words, the uh, marginal revenue product curve of any factor will be the demand curve for that factor by employers or by businessmen, I should say, because I mean anybody who uses uh, hires equipment or, or labor or buys machines or rents land or whatever. <clears throat> so the factor goods, the demand curve for factors will be the marginal revenue product curve of the factor. Okay. Uh, Supply curve of factors, whatever it is, I mean, immediate short run, something like that. And therefore, the wage rate or the price of any factor will be the intersection, as usual, of supply and demand. It'll be the demand. We're determining what the demand curve is. Supply curve is determined by what's existed. Yeah? Huh? What do you mean start out? I mean down here? Yeah, okay. And then you hire. 
Right. You say that you're making a profit of $2 a worker. Well, no, at this point, you're making a profit of $2 a worker, extra profit. And you keep hiring people, you finally get down to the point where you make no further profit from hiring one more worker. And you're, you're, at this point here, you're, getting, you're making two, a marginal profit of $2 a worker. So this is a margin. In other words, it's how much you make uh, per worker. So you keep hiring people until, until you absorb and you get the maximum amount of profit. Right? In, other words, if you can, if you, in other words, here you're making $2 extra profit per worker. And if you hire another worker, you're making $1.90 per worker. You keep going. Until, the, until you have the maximum profit. In other words, until the MRP and the wage rate is the same, and the profit is now the profit per the additional profit is zero. This is the additional profit for that for the next worker, so to speak. No, this is the margin. In other words, if you stop right here, you're you're losing all this money you could be making. This is for how much you're getting for the next worker, so it's the unit, the marginal unit, right? In other words. You're losing out of the dollar ninety, dollar eighty, dollar seventy, and all the rest of this if you don't keep hiring people. Your object is not to maximize the marginal difference, marginal profit. Your object is to maximize the total profit. You can only get the largest total profit by absorbing all of this, all of this profit. Okay. It's a tough. That's that's probably the, the big, most important sticking point for students. The important thing is this is the, this is the marginal rate. And this is the profit per unit worker you're getting. Uh, as you're going, as you as you keep going, as you add one more, <clears throat> this is not the total. Remember that this is this is the this is the margin. At this point this is the marginal product, the marginal uh, weight worker, or the marginal machine that you're getting. <clears throat> um, so the intersection point, supply and demand, then gives you the what the wage rate actually is. Uh, so we've talked about a fully demand curve for labor and for everything else, but we haven't decided, determined what it is. Now we know what it is. The marginal revenue product curve for each uh, worker or each machine or each unit. This is the so-called marginal productivity theory. Of, it's called the marginal productivity theory of wages. What it really is, is the marginal productivity theory of all factors of production. In other words, the reason why factor of production might spend a certain amount for a machine or a, or a rent of land is because you think it will benefit you in, in producing stuff for, for to sell the consumers, in other words, to put it this way, famous, I think, W. Stanley Jevons, famous economist, late 19th century, pointed out the reason why you, the rent of land in Champagne country in France is very, very high. If you're producing top quality Champagne, it's like, I don't know, $10,000 an acre or something. The rent of land in some, in some ways in the desert is a couple of dollars an acre. The reason you're paying so much land in the Champagne country is not because, well, put it this way, the reason the price of Champagne is so high is not because you're paying a higher rent in the in Champagne land. The reason why you're paying such a high rent champagne land is you know that that champagne is very is worth a lot to the consumers. They'll pay a lot for it. In other words, it's the fact that this particular little area of France, uh, the grapes grown there are very high quality, very high quality, great demand by the consumers. Because of that, employers and farmers, etc., bid up the land a great deal, bid up the rent to a very high level. So most people think that the, the people charge a high price, let's say, because they're paying a high rent. That's not the reason. There's no, there's no God-given reason. There's no divine, divine mandate that the rent has to be high in the champagne country. It's high in the champagne country because the product is so expensive, such so high quality. Because the product is such great demand, people pay high rents for it. If, if a, a crummier wine somewhere else, 50 miles away, which is very cheap, the rent is low because the, because the product is cheap. It's not the other way around. In other words, the rent is determined the price doesn't, the rent doesn't cause the price. So it's not a cost theory of price. Because you have to pay a higher rent, you have to, you're charging a high price for the wine. You only get the high price for the wine because the consumers want it. Because it's in high demand. Because it's in high demand, the scarce resources that produce it, such as land, are bid up very high. So, in other words, the demand curve for this land goes way up, the price goes way up, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so the, the price of the factor is determined by the marginal by the product, product by how much the, the, the product is worth to the consumer, uh, the demand curve of the, cons of the consumer for the product, which then bids it up, which makes a very high marginal revenue product. So, uh, so, so price determines rent. In other words, the price of the product determines the rent, not the other way around. The rent is the, the, rent is the expectation you'd be able to charge a high price for the product. And, uh, if, uh, for example, these Italian wines, where they, you know, there's a big, there's a big scandal recently because they put a lot of poison in Italian wines. Uh, my very clear prediction is the price, not only will the price of these wines go way down, but the rent of the land of, of producing it will go way down as a result. 
So uh, the rent is fluctuation in accordance with how much people can get for the product. Okay, that's enough for the night. That's a lot of stuff. Okay, so I'm going to spend some time recapping this stuff. And um, one thing is we have, we're having a very peculiar, let's see, we're having a very peculiar term this term, as you know. Next Thursday is, a, is we don't meet because that's a, that's a holiday, Jewish holiday. So, so, huh? What? Next Thursday. So that's the 20, what's today? 24, they don't meet. So Tuesday after that and Thursday after that we meet. And then the following Monday becomes a Thursday and a magic transformation that we engage here in Polly. So that we will meet Monday the 5th. Was the 5th, is it? Yeah, Monday, May the 5th. That will be our last two-hour class. No. Yeah. Well, yeah, last two-hour class, which, which will also be our exam. In other words, our final, final exam will be in the last two-hour class. Monday, May the 5th. Now, this is... I don't know if this is strictly kosher, but I'm doing it anyway. I see no reason... See, no reason not to. This is a two. <laughs> okay. This is a two-hour class, and the the exams are three-hour exam. I never get more than two-hour exam anyway. So it doesn't. Monday, May the fifth will be the final. This is, remember, that's a that's a so-called Thursday. <laughs> it will be Thursday will be transformed magically into Monday on May the fifth, and we'll meet in this in this room. Yeah, so that will be the final. I haven't made up the final yet, but the final will, one will cover the whole term, and two. There'll be some kind of objective test. I'm not sure yet. There'll be no long essays. There'll be either multiple choice, fill in the blanks, uh, something like that, some combination, or short identification questions, perhaps, like you know, marginal, you know, in one brief paragraph, what is what is the identifier, what's the significance of marginal utility, something like that. There'll be some. There won't be any long essays, and <clears throat> we'll cover the whole term. So, uh, <clears throat> okay, that's uh, that's all I can say about it now. Any rate, um, so I also have blue books. I think blue books, they stopped making blue books for a while, but I think I've, I've now got another cache of them. I hoarded some blue books over the years. I, sus I suspect that something like that would happen. Some, someday they'll crack down on blue books. <laughs> but anyway, there's a new supply, <laughs> a new supply of blue books. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if the quality is down or not. <laughs> Like blue books to me. At any rate, <coughs> uh, the uh, to, to go through the uh, summarize uh, some some extent some length uh, last uh, Tuesday stuff. We're trying to find out. We know that all prices are for, are, are equal uh, are formed by equal equaling supply and demand. In other words, the falling demand curve is a given supply line for everything. Shh, for consumer goods, for capital goods, for raw materials, for labor. Any price on the market is determined by the stock of the product, <coughs> the supply, a given supply at any time, and the demand for them in the minds of the buyers. In other words, the evaluation, how much the buyers are willing to pay, how much they're willing to buy at any given, just different given price. This is the price and the quantity. And of course, any, any uh, maximum or minimum price controls will cause shortages or surpluses. <coughs> so, <coughs> So we dealt with consumer goods mostly in the first half of the term and how the demand curve is formed, the more margin utility, diminishing margin utility, et cetera, et cetera. Now we're getting to producers' goods, in other words, uh, factors of production, prices of labor, land, capital goods, machinery, et cetera. We know they have a falling demand curve. We know they have a given supply. And we know also if the demand curve goes up and the prices and profits increase, there'll be more greater supply in a few years. The same works for labor, too, of course. If there's a, We'll see the labor market today. Talk about the labor market. See, if there's a big increase in demand for plumbers, let's say, as, as compared to carpenters, <coughs> the, the wage rates for plumbers will go up, and people will see that. Youngsters coming up and want to go into something. We'll see, ah, plumbers are, you know, there's a big increase in plumber wage rates. They start going into the plumbing occupation, and the supply, supply of plumbers increases, and the wage rate will fall relatively to some extent and uh, we'll reach another equilibrium point. So the whole thing works for, for labor as well as capital goods. And of course, there are different time lags here. In other words, some occupations will take just a few months to get into it. Others will take many years, like physicians or whatever. Or whatever. But at any rate, if you assume that the, that the, that the increased demand is permanent, um, people go into it. For example, during the 1960s, Around the late 60s and 70s, everybody, everybody and his brother and sister went to law school. It was a big craze to go to law school. I'm not knocking law school, but 
Everybody went into it, including all the pickets, I mean, former pickets and SDS pickets in college. They all wind up in law school. So, of course, the result is, was an over, quote, oversupply, unquote, of lawyers, meaning that they were not getting the income they'd like to become accustomed to. And so the law boom, law craze began to fall off. People started going to other stuff, computers or whatever. So there are different waves of occupations that people get attracted to. When I was going to college, everybody went to nuclear physics. That was the big, that was the big <laughs> occupation. Okay. Uh, so, uh, at any rate, this, so, this, so there are different, and, and it's a response basically, of course, it's a response to the interest of each person, but it's also a response to the demand for it, the uh, jobs and the wage, the wage rates, the salaries you can get. At any rate, so, then the question we dealt with on Tuesday is, given the fact there's a falling demand curve for factors of production, what determines it? What specific, it's not the utility, it's not marginal utility, but that's the consumers. In other words, consumers evaluate Wonder Bread or, 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 or hi-fi sets. Producers, businessmen, are not, they don't buy it for their own sake. They don't buy, they don't hire workers to sit there and look at them. They're trying to produce a product which they hope consumers will buy. <clears throat> so in other words, the demand for factors of production is what's called derived demand, derived from consumer demand for the product. And some, of course, some raw materials go into different products. Steel and aluminum can go into dozens of different final products for the consumer. So the derived demand gets passed down from the consumer to the various stages of production to the various factors in the demand curve. <clears throat> a derived demand is not automatic. It's not sort of a, you don't push a button uh, and, and increase the demand. It, it, it goes, it's derived by the fact that entrepreneurs or businessmen always looking for prof profitable investments will say, hey, well, I think consumers are going to buy a lot of computers, or personal computers in the next few years, let's say. So we'll start going into the personal computer business. And they start hiring engineers or whatever and you know, building a plant and so, so forth and so on to produce it. Expecting, in other words, derived demand is really expected. This expectation that consumers will want to buy it, that you're catching the wave, you're catching the, the big wave. Okay? Sometimes you catch it too late. Some if you're a lousy entrepreneur, you, you get into the business just after, just as it's sinking into the West, you know, just as it's declining, you enter the business. Uh, other, those who have the ear to the ground and can, who intuitively can grasp the situation will be one of the first people to be a computer, a, a personal computer manufacturer or whatever, you know, whatever the next big wave is. And uh, you have to, first you have to know the market and you have to have insight. There's, there's no way to teach it. It's, what's going to be the next thing 10 years from now? Uh, but at any rate, so if you expect the, the demand, you, you try to catch it, and you're an entrepreneur, and you go into the business, and you hope that this will be, uh, reflect the increased demand of the consumers. So uh, whatever it's going to be, personal something or other, at least the com compact disc, whatever the next thing after the compact disc, there's a big laser, whatever the hell it is. So that's, <laughs> at any rate, so this is what, um, this is how the demand is derived. It's not automatic. Many economists sort of think of it as automatic. You push a button, the demand gets passed down to the, to the structure of production. It's, it's, it relies on the businessmen, entrepreneurs, to see, to look at what's going on, to forecast correctly, and to then hire the workers and build the plants and factories and everything to, to make this possible, <clears throat> to meet the demand. If they don't meet it correctly, they make losses. If they meet it correctly, they make profits, and inspire them to do more. Okay, more resources going into the hands of the successful entrepreneurs and fewer resources in the hands of those who funk out and go bankrupt. At any rate, so the demand, the derived demand, the, the demand curve for factors of production, the derivation is through this, these various formulas I gave you on Tuesday. In other words, the, uh, we look again at the production function, the fact that, um, and this is sort of philosophic truth, a mathematical philosophic truth for all all action, for all use of means to achieve ends, that a certain amount of x, factor x, combined with in a certain way, combined with in whatever way it's going to be, a certain amount of factor y, combined with a certain amount of z, will bring a dot, 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 in other words, many factors, will bring about a certain quantity of product, q of r. I use r because I can't use p. p usually means prices. So I'm just using r as a symbol of, do you have a question? Uh, so, that's the so-called production function, an abstract function relating uh, means to ends. In other words, relating factors of production combined in certain ways by managers or entrepreneurs to yield a certain amount of product. <clears throat> so we saw before, we used this before to show that um, that's linear and homogeneous. By definition, since co equal causes always yield equal effects, that n times each amount will yield n times the product. And we said, well, this is, if that's true, how come you don't have constant average costs? 
Why isn't the average course curve horizontal and flat? And the reason is because you can't multiply everything by n in practice. And, and in practice, some, these things have different degrees of indivisibility. In other words, the paper clips are very divisible. You can always order 50, you know, twice as many paper clips. You can't have twice as many railroads or very, very easily. You can't have twice as many factories. That's much more indivisible. So what you have is different degrees of, indivisibility, of divisibility. Um, a small machine will be divisible. A big, a big machine will be much, much less divisible, et cetera, et cetera. And you therefore wind up, you're tapping the indivisibilities as you increase production. And therefore, you have the declining force curve and then going up because you're getting, you're eliminating a lot of these indivisibilities. You're getting to the point where you're making full use of your fixed equipment. <clears throat> so uh, now what we do is, instead of looking at multiplying everything by n, we're trying to look at each factor. What's the productivity of each factor? What does each factor contribute to the product? The way we do it is we freeze all factors except one. We freeze beta, gamma, etc. cetera. Make, make them as given, and we vary alpha and see what happens to the product. <clears throat> the alpha can be any given product. You take any laborer, any machine, or any piece of land, vary that. We're doing this conceptually. This is what's done on the market almost automatically, an interplay of the market. We're doing conceptually. We're taking, okay, assume we freeze all the, all the variables except one, and see what happens when you vary one of them, what happens to the product. So then what we have is, on the y-axis, instead of dollars or price, we now have physical units, uh, bushels of wheat, uh, high five size, loaves of bread, whatever it happens to be. This is, the Q is on the y-axis, or uh, physical units, I should say. And what you have in um, the x-axis is whatever the variable factor is, units of the variable factor, from zero up to you know, n. So quantity of alpha is on the x-axis, and physical units is on the y-axis bushels of wheat, and, uh, or you know, loaves of bread, whatever it happens to be. <clears throat> if you have no variable factor, then you have no product. And you start, therefore, the point of origin. No workers, lots of land, and lots of machines, and nothing's going to happen. As you vary the, the fact, if you increase the factors from zero up, product will go up, of course. You start getting some product as you, as you keep going. Uh, av and av this is the average product line now. Uh, average physical product is a finest product per variable factor. In other words, if you're producing wheat, okay, you have you have lots of you have workers, you have machinery, you have land, you're freezing land and, and for this for the moment, you're keeping those as given. Keeping the equipment, the machinery, the tractors, the fertilizer, all the rest of it, and the land, you're keeping given. You vary the number of laborers. You start with zero, you got no product. And then this is our product per labor. In other words, what we're saying is lately Product, average physical product will start going up from zero to something. Okay? The law of diminishing returns, the basic law, technological, philosophic law, so to speak, is that average physical product will eventually turn down, cannot go up forever. That's the law. In other words, the uh, law of diminishing returns is that, not that returns always diminish, but that eventually the average physical product turns downward as you keep increasing the, the variable factor. In other words, as, as alpha increases, uh, APP eventually declines. <clears throat> and the reason for that is that products are different. In fact, every factor is different. There's no perfect substitutability of factors. You can substitute to some extent. If you can have more capital goods and less workers, you can have more workers and less machines, you can have more aluminum and less steel, whatever. But the substitution is not perfect. It can't be perfect, because if it were perfect, it would be the same thing. Only the same thing is, 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 can be perfectly substitutable for itself, so to speak. Even Wonder Bread, those of us who are Wonder Bread fans, there's no perfect substitute for Wonder Bread. I mean, I can eat tasty bread. Uh, it's a substitute, but it's an imperfect substitute. It's not the same, it's not, it doesn't have the same yumminess <laughs> as Wonder Bread. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> as a result, there's a lot of substitutes in, in, the, in the world, but they're imperfect, not perfect. So, if they were perfect, you can keep pouring. In other words, if you had uh, only 100 acres of wheat, of land, and a, and, a, and a certain number amount of fertilizer machines, you could increase the amount of wheat indefinitely by just adding more workers. You have two million workers on 100 acres. So each produce an increasing wheat. Of course, you can't do that. The one thing the workers will get into each other's way. They'll start be no room to stand or, or walk. So the production will start declining very rapidly. <clears throat> 
So what we're saying is that in the same way, if you just if you have the same amount of workers, have ten workers and two million acres, they're not going to be able to do. I won't be able to use this stuff. It'd be running around like crazy trying to sow the wheat or whatever, and as a result, the whole thing will collapse. So what you have, in other words, is as you increase the variable factor and freeze the the other factors, given beta, gamma, etc., as constant, and you keep increasing the variable factor, eventually APP will go will turn downward, and start declining. It's a law which is derived from the basic knowledge of reality. It doesn't have to be confirmed empirically. It is con Economists try to confirm empirically. Well, of course, it always, it always has to be confirmed empirically. There's no way you cannot have this law. And to try to test it by going out to an exper agricultural experimental station, some of these guys do. I mean, if, you, if you don't waste your time, it's okay, but it's really, it's really, I don't, don't have to do it. <clears throat> so, then we have our basic average marginal relationship here, remember, which is, a basic, which is simply a mathematical relationship. For every average, there's a marginal. In other words, if you have, as I said before, a couple of weeks ago, if you're averaging the height of this class for whatever reason, uh, if two basketball players walk in, you're going to raise the, height, the average height. Because the mar in other words, the margin, if, if, if for average to go up, if the average of x is increasing, that means that the marginal x, then the marginal of x is, is greater than the average of x. The same way if, uh, if two midgets walk in, two three-footers or four-footers walk in, it's going to drag down the average. Because in other words, if the average is, so if the average is decreasing, then the marginal of x is less than the average. I talked about this when we dealt with cost, but the same thing applies to product. It's a, it's a simple mathematical dash philosophical relationship. And so therefore, if these two things are true, and it's obviously true then, if, if, aver if the average reaches, it becomes flat for a minute. In other words, if the average is at a peak and turning just about to turn downward, like so, or if it's at a trough and just about to turn up, like so, in other words, if the average is constant for a moment, then the marginal has to equal the average, the only way to get from one to the other. <clears throat> so to look at it another way, if, if, if the average height of this class is 5'8", and two 5'8 guys walk in, the average will remain the same. In other words, the marginal is then equal to the average. So, okay, so in other words, in the case, so with costs, uh, remember with average cost, it's going like that. Well, let's, let's take the U shape for a second. And marginal cost was below it when it was decreasing, above it when it's increasing, and therefore has to cut, it intersect with a trough point uh, when it's constant. And uh, similarly now with, of course, if you have a flat like that, this can intersect permanent, you know, for the whole range. Average will equal marginal, that uh, whole plateau, the whole flat bottom. <clears throat> uh, similarly here, in the, in the case of productivity, as it's called, average productivity and marginal productivity, marginal physical productivity, product, which is equal to, defined as delta Q divided by delta alpha. So in other words, how much... You add one more worker, how much, how many new bushels of wheat you need to get? Um, while average product is going up, it's going to be higher. It's going to go like this, MPP. And then it's going to, when it's declining, it's going to be lower. And when it's a peak point, it's going to be equal. So here you have your two curves. Average physical product, marginal physical product, which intersects at the peak point. And if you keep going, Eventually, marginal physical power will cut the x-axis and be negative. Uh, the average is not, obviously, you can't have an a negative average product. There's no such thing as producing minus 20 bushels of wheat. But you can, you can reduce, you can have, you can produce less than you did before. You keep adding workers and fix the amount of capital and, and, machine, and land. You're going to wind up by, add one more worker, you get less wheat produced. So the marginal product can be, and that can be negative. Marginal product can be and that can be negative. Marginal product can be and that can be negative. Marginal product can be and that can be negative. Marginal product can be and that can be negative. Marginal product can be and that can be negative. Marginal product can be.